Please know I am but a humble raven puff and do not own or take credit for any of the magical fanfictions on this podcasting channel. Nor do I own any rights or magical say on J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter characters that are mentioned within these stories. These fanfictions are the result of much more creative and dedicated minds than my own, and I will be introducing these authors as well as where to find their other works at the beginning of every episode. Hello, my magical brethren, and welcome to Fox's Fix, a podcast that attempts the sonorous charm on some of your favorite Harry Potter fan fictions. So whether you're taking the night bus across town, denoming your garden, or simply shopping through Diagon Alley, this is a podcast that allows even the busiest witches and wizards a chance to listen to their favorite fan fiction. So I'd say it's time we take a page out of Fox's book and light up this week's fan fiction. Fox's Fix presents the unabridged audiobook of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. Bex Chan's novel-length fanfiction can be located on fanfiction.net as well as archiveofourown.org. Warning, this fanfiction is rated mature for its explicit language, content, and themes. Chapter 14. Crave. No. Tonk shook her head. The letter the boy sent Remus didn't explain much. But does it really matter? As long as it's gone. I guess not, Hermione agreed absently. I just wish I could do a little more to help. And maybe if I knew how they destroyed the locket, I could- You're doing fine, Tonks assured her friend. Things are going well. The ministry is holding fine, and another horcrux has been destroyed. Don't get me wrong, we could be doing better. A lot better, Hermione sighed, combing her curls out of her face with her fingers. I should have just gone with them. Your talents are best suited helping McGonagall at Hogwarts. The boys are clearly doing okay, and the Order wanted one of you to stay where we could reach you. Tonks said. I know, Hermione frowned tiredly, rubbing her eyes. I just, I just don't know how much use I am here. All I seem to be doing is organizing Christmas balls and other head stuff that is just completely unnecessary. You can't blame McGonagall for trying to keep spirits up. The older witch offered her a light shrug. A Christmas ball could be good for you. You told me how much fun you had at the Yule Ball. Have any famous Bulgarians asked you to go this time? Hermione felt a smile crawl up her cheeks. No, no Bulgarians. But... Michael asked me if I would like to go with him. She mumbled. Who's Michael? Michael Corner, Hermione explained with a thoughtful click of her tongue. But I think he only mentioned it because we're both the heads. I mean, I hope that's the only reason. Why? Tonks asked, arching an eyebrow. Is he a bit of an idiot? No, no, he's nice enough, Hermione said. I just... I don't know, I... You like someone else. Hermione snapped her head up to study Tongs with wild eyes, as panic seized her chest. What? She stuttered. What do you mean? Ron. The other witch grinned knowingly. We all saw how friendly you were at the wedding, and you told me you liked him. Oh, Ron. Hermione breathed, taking a second for the relief to wash over her. Yes, of course. Ron. You okay, Miney? Tongs asked with a concerned look. Yes, I'm fine, Hermione muttered with uncertainty. I'm just not very good with unfamiliar beds. I didn't get much sleep last night. Now, it wasn't technically a lie. She had certainly been awake for the majority of the night, but the scratchy mattress had little to do with her inability to savor a dream. She'd stared expectantly at her clock for long and lonely hours, waiting, almost hoping, that the alarm would sound, that Draco would need her back. It had been unnerving to lie in a bed and know he wasn't in the room next door, and her thoughts had centered around him from sunset to sunrise. Tongs had just been on the other side of the door, but she had felt very much alone, and she couldn't help but wonder how Draco was dealing with this secluded night in the Gryffindor Tower. After the last incident, when she stayed with Ginny and he tried to escape, 
She had expected something, but clearly he was doing just fine if her little clock was silent, and that honestly bothered her a little. When she had finished her classes earlier today, she had considered stopping by to check on him, but a convenient flashback of her attempt to kiss him had made her think twice. After some lunch and a slow walk around Hogsmeade, where the first hints of Christmas were starting to glow, she and Tonks had discussed the war in depth, along with many other topics. But her mind always snatched her back to Draco. Ron and I aren't together, you know, she told Tonks, somewhat defensively. We're just friends. The Auror frowned. You don't like him, Miney? I thought... I thought I did too, Hermione admitted. But I just think we're better as friends. I... I don't like him the way I should. Tonks chuckled and gave the younger witch an affectionate pat on the back. No one's forcing you to fancy Ron, Miney. If you don't, then you don't. Did you and Remus get a lot of criticism when you first got together? She questioned carefully. Because of your age difference? A lot of people were quick to judge, Tonks said thoughtfully. Remus was more bothered by it than me, but yes, we had a bit of a hassle from nosy sods who had nothing better to do with their time. Did you ever question your feelings? Tonks sighed and tapped her knee pensively. I knew people wouldn't think it was normal, she confessed after a moment. And it probably would have been easier to be with someone my own age. But you can't pick and choose things like that. It just happens. Hermione tilted her head and gave her friend a gentle smile. Was it worth it? She asked. The disapproving looks and the criticism and... Bloody hell yes! Tonks exclaimed. Look, when there's a war going on and a baby on the way, the gossipy pricks of London are the least of your worries. Plus, if I had ignored my feelings for Remus, I would have regretted it for the rest of my life. The brunette chewed her lower lip and hummed in consideration. I guess... I guess time's too precious when the world could end tomorrow. That's a little pessimistic. Tonks gave her a friendly wink. But yes, life's too short. Have you got your eye on someone, Miney? Scared the boys won't approve? Her lip twitched. Something like that. Anyone I know? Your cousin, she thought. No, she said aloud, shaking her head. He's just one of the boys in my year. But Harry and Ron aren't very fond of him. Well, at least that wasn't a lie. They'll get over it. Tonks assured her with a dismissive wave of her hand. So, what's he like? Hermione paused to gather her wits and words. Tonks had that trustworthy manner about her that often coaxed secrets to tumble out of her mouth, and she needed to be careful with how much she divulged. He's an asshole, Hermione started bluntly, noting the amused flash in Tonks' eyes. He's incorrigible. He's complicated, and he doesn't listen to a word I say. That's typical of most men. He's rude, Hermione continued with her rant. He's arrogant, he's cruel, and he's very cold. Also quite common. And sometimes he makes me so angry I could just throttle him or hex him into the bloody next continent. Tonks cleared her breath to smolder a laugh and studied her young companion with a wise smirk. But? Hermione swallowed and felt tears scratch the back of her eyes. But he's beautiful, she whispered sadly. Completely messed up and utterly awful. But there's something there which is just so beautiful to me. I can't really explain it. It felt so weird but wonderful to say it all aloud to another person. But of course, she was censoring all the darker details that came with her Slytherin housemate. Her pseudo-big sister was eyeing her sympathetically, tucking some strands of violet behind her ear, and looking very much pleased with Hermione's confession. Oh, Tonks, if only you knew. Do you know how he feels about you? Hermione frowned and bowed her head. Well, he tells me he hates me. Have you two ever kissed? 
Tonks pushed boldly. Hermione felt a hot blush stain her cheeks. Well, a few times, she murmured quietly. But they were impulsive, and they didn't last long. Who kissed who? Well, Hermione hesitated. I initiated the first one, but he's kissed me twice since then. Tong's playful smile stretched up her face. Sounds promising to me. No, Hermione disagreed, wrinkling her nose with disappointment. It's more complicated than that. He shoved me away the last time I tried. And I don't even know if I like him, really. There's just, there's something there that... She trailed off and Tonks gave her a reassuring nod. You know you can tell me anything, she urged. There's just something that hurts, Hermione finished, her voice hitching. He has this, this shield up, and I don't think I could ever get through to him. I'm trying, but every time I think I'm getting somewhere, he just ruins it, and I don't know if I have the energy to do it anymore. Miney. I keep seeing these glimpses of a decent person in him, she carried on, a tear skimming down her cheek, and I think that's what I'm attracted to, but I- Hermione, it's okay. He just sounds a little confused. He'll come around. But what if- Just do what feels right, sweetheart, Tonks advised slowly, and Hermione recalled saying some very similar words to Draco. Would you like some tea before bed? (sighs) Thanks, Tonks. But could I have some hot chocolate instead? Draco was sat in a crumbled heap on the cold floorboards, absently fiddling with the remains of Granger's snow globe. He caught a shard awkwardly and hissed the air through his teeth as his finger wept a ruby teardrop. He eyed his blood critically, and a cold shiver ran up his spine as he recalled the day in the bathroom when there had been so much more blood, and not just his. Granger's blood was exactly the same. That had been a damning realization, and he blamed that for every predicament that had followed, as well as the epiphanies that had struck him in her absence. The crippling fact of the matter was, Granger had every trait he admired. Intelligence, wit, strength, and then something that he couldn't put his finger on. She was simply good. If I was a pureblood, with exactly the same personality, would you be so quick to discard what happened this morning? His brain had been flooded with her words ever since she'd left. Every sentence that had ever made him doubt his prejudices had reverberated in his skull, but he was holding firmly onto the flimsy whispers of his family's ways. What had once felt so obvious and right now felt fickle and faint. He'd like to blame it all on her, but he had come to acknowledge there must have been cracks in his beliefs before, but it didn't make it any easier. You're human, Draco and you've made mistakes, but I can't hate you for that. He clenched his eyes shut. Mistakes. The astronomy tower. Surely if he'd been so certain that Voldemort and his principles were correct, the task of killing Dumbledore would have been an easy thing to do. Maybe he started to doubt it all then. They're just labels, you know. Slytherin, Gryffindor, Pure blood and mud blood. They don't dictate how we live our lives. It was easy for her to say that. There were expectations that came with his infamous surname, and she couldn't begin to imagine the pressure he'd been under. He was certain that Potter had told her all about his breakdown in the toilets last term, but that had just been a sliver of his turmoil. There had been times when he'd cast every silencing charm he knew and just screamed until his lungs had torn. Blaze and Pansy had seen some of his weaker moments, 
but nobody had been there to witness his real outbursts of chaos. Even before he'd been given his task, Draco had sometimes found himself staring at his reflection and wondering if a lifestyle full of hatred was all just too much for him. Why do you have to put on an act when I'm the only person that sees you? Because if he didn't, then what else was there? If he'd been stripped of his wealth, his magic, his status, if he abandoned what he had been designed to become, there was nothing left. Some people are beyond change, Granger. Not you. Fucking hell, he groaned to himself, dropping his face in his palms. You, you asked me to stay. I wanted to stay. He'd never kissed someone like that before, like a rebellious burst that had made him feel loose and unchained. He'd been aware of who he was when he was kissing her, and that he shouldn't have been touching her at all. But at that moment, he couldn't have given a shit. And on closer inspection, he really didn't give a shit now. There was no one here to scold him for thinking for himself, and just doing what felt. Just do what feels right. Ugh, it's too dangerous. But ultimately, too tempting. The pathetic truth was, was he missed her. And not just as a distraction. He missed her as a person. Her voice, her little quirks, her fire, just everything. She would be back tomorrow, although he had no idea what time. It could be fairly early in the morning for all he knew. So, his decision to sleep in her bed again was a rather risky one, and another damaging blow to his pride. But it felt right. Tonks had left at eight, and Hermione had managed to get to the school before the weekend lazy students had started to rouse in Rome. She was so nervous, she had chewed her lower lip until it had bled, which had meant a slight detour at the prefix bathroom to heal the cut. Perhaps she was stalling, but she had spent a good few minutes scrutinizing her reflection and trying to concoct a strategy to deal with Draco after her embarrassing behavior two days ago. Deciding that she had put it off long enough, she headed to her dorm and hesitated, taking in a deep breath before she muttered the appropriate password. She slipped inside her dorm, intending to be as quiet as possible, but a rush of wind had slammed the door shut behind her. Oh, bugger. She froze as she heard shuffling from the other side of the dorm, but... It sounded misplaced, almost like it was coming from her room, not Draco's. No sooner had the thought crossed her mind that her door was flung open to release a very intense-looking Slytherin. Draco had clearly just woken up, his hair was roguishly mussed, and he was clad in just a vest and loose pajama bottoms. But it was the purposeful, and slightly wild glint in his eyes that made her heart pause. He lingered in the doorframe for just a moment, staring at her, like he wasn't sure if she was there at all. Hermione shook away her trance, and then anger hit her, just as he began to march towards her with bold strides. Were you in my room? Yes, he spat quickening his steps and slicing the distance between them. How the hell did you get- Draco cut her off, grabbing her face and snatching her lips with a desperate kiss. He sighed shakily into her mouth, uncaring that she felt stiff and unresponsive against him. And just acting on instinct, he pulled away but kept her close, relishing her little pants tickling his chin. He clenched his jaw and kept his eyes closed, readying himself for her rejection and outrage. 
but she tilted her head to latch back onto him. Her gesture was timid, but it was enough for him, and he shoved her roughly against the door, swallowing her gasp in his mouth. His movements were frantic and almost feral as he sucked her in and took greedy nips at her winter-wet lips. She kept up with him, though, licking and pecking back with dissipating nerves, clutching onto his arms with trembling fingers. His hands drifted up her cheekbones and into her coffee curls, coaxing a moan from her that made his hips twitch. He pressed himself against her as much as he could, dragging his fingertips down her neck, her shoulders, her ribs, to settle possessively on her sides. He groaned as she combed her nails through his hair, catching a sensitive spot at his spine that made him shiver in a wonderful way. Their hot breaths clashed between kisses, and Draco decided he needed more. No, he craved it. He tore his mouth away and moved to her throat, pleasantly surprised when she lulled her head back and sighed in apparent bliss. Her grip on his biceps tightened as he found a receptive spot near her ear that seemed to make her blood rush, and her pulse felt tantalizing under his tongue. Tell me to stop, Draco mumbled against her skin, barely audible. Hermione swallowed hard, but didn't utter a word to break their contact. Too lost in the pace and passion that was completely foreign to her. She was vaguely aware that he was pushing away her robes, but the thought of stopping him was a distant whisper at the back of her skull. She heard them thud to the floor, just as he lifted his head to steal her upper lip again, his warm and eager palms sliding under her jumper. Her hands dropped to rest against his chest, and she scratched curiously at his collarbone and neck. Granger, tell me to stop. Draco hissed out, more urgently this time, nipping at her jaw as he did so. His hands grazed upwards, until his thumbs stroked the underside of her cotton-covered breasts. Her fingernails were raking down his stomach, and he felt himself harden as she went lower and lower. And that was when reality struck him. Granger, tell me to stop! He screamed ripping himself away from her so frantically, he stumbled to the floor a few feet away. Hermione felt her limbs go weak, and she slid gracelessly down to the floor, studying Draco intently and anxiously. He looked broken and battered, like all of his energy was being used to refrain from touching her. He slowly raised his head, and they locked eyes, both sets shocked and wide. Why? Didn't you tell me to stop? He growled accusingly. Are you fucking stupid, Granger? Do you think this is normal? She was shaking. I I don't. Do you have any idea what this place is doing to me? He asked coldly. What you are doing to me? Draco, please. Look at me, he yelled. I do not. Do shit like this. That desperate for a quick fuck that I would touch a mudblood virgin. Don't you dare call me that, she warned angrily. Which one? He fired back. You're telling me that someone has actually crawled between your thighs? Granger cringed at his words, but remained silent and Draco felt the jealousy stab his stomach painfully. Oh, let me guess, he sneered darkly. Weasley, that's none of your business. It is now, he fired back. Why? She retorted bravely, squaring her shoulders. You've made it quite clear, Draco, that this mistake was just an attempt to land a quick fuck. He faltered, but kept his scowl firm. And what the hell were you expecting, Granger? All of your pro-mudblood shit to sink in? I know some of it has, she said steadily. And you know it too. 
And why the fuck should I have to change to appease you, Granger? It's not about changing yourself. It's about finding yourself, she argued loudly, too enraged to cry. Don't waste your Gryffindor crap on me. Have you ever been happy, Draco? She asked him hopefully, carefully shifting a little closer to him. Have you ever really felt content with your life or done anything that felt right to you? He hesitated, shifting through his fractured memories, trying to find one with her requirements. But the only time he could ever recall feeling a sense of peace was the night she had slept in his lap. And perhaps now, when he was gorging on her taste. But before that, only darkness. Just a hatred for her kind that had engulfed him in any chance of contentment. Look me in the eye, she said softly, coming to sit at his side. And tell me that you still completely believe that Muggleborns are inferior. That I am disgusting. He parted his lips to indulge in a vile and scornful rant. But he couldn't do it. Salazar knew he wanted to. But she looked too perfect then for him to even pretend she was filthy. Lips slightly swollen and hair deliciously tousled. No, he couldn't do it. Leave me alone, he murmured instead, hoping he sounded somewhere near threatening although he doubted it. She leaned in to rest her palm against his shoulder, and the tingle it brought was too reminiscent for him. Don't touch me! Hermione withdrew her hand reluctantly. Draco, do you like kissing me? She stuttered uneasily. Yes, he thought. Ask me instead if I like betraying my family, he shot back harshly. Ask me if I would be doing any of this, if it wasn't for this hellhole. Well, I like kissing you, she confessed in a rushed whisper. But I am getting so tired of trying to convince you that I am not someone you should hate. What do you want from me, Granger? Nothing more than you can give me, she told him gently. I just want you to stop pretending and do what feels right for you for once. And how the fuck would you know what feels right for me? He challenged. You think a few stupid kisses are enough to erase what I think about your kind? You and I... You and I are nothing, he protested heatedly. I told you, I clearly needed a shag. Bad enough that I would... Lower yourself enough to touch a mudblood, she finished for him. You know what, Draco? You flinch when you say it now. No, I do not. Yes, you do. He faltered. Something about the conviction in her tone stirred the heat in his gut again. And before he could stop himself, he had practically pounced on her and was kissing her again. The unsatisfied aftershocks of the last round were raw and consuming. But he managed to stop himself before he got carried away this time. He released her with a loud groan, resting his forehead against hers, drawing in loud and ragged breaths as he fought his cravings. He'd gone too far. Hermione studied his agitated expression and felt her chest ache. She willed herself to be patient and understanding, but she wondered how much more she could give him. Gulping back her nerves, she decided she would give him one final opportunity to redeem the situation, even if it meant sacrificing another piece of her waning dignity for the sake of a Death Eater. Merlin, help her. Draco, she murmured breathlessly, look at me. His eyes snapped open and regarded her wearily as she placed a soothing palm against his cheek. It's okay, she told him. I know this is... You don't have a fucking clue, he ground out, yanking away from her and stumbling to his feet. 
You can't even begin to comprehend what this place is doing to my head. Draco, I... I am telling you now, Granger, that nothing like this will ever happen again. We are done. And his words were so measured and crisp that she found herself believing them. Yes, we are done, she replied, rising to stand and straightening her back defiantly. She'd reached her limit. I refuse to do this anymore. I do not deserve to be treated like this. And by you. Do whatever the hell you want. But I don't give a shit anymore. Well, finally, he exclaimed. She gets it. I'm glad you eventually decided to see some sense. Accept this for what it is, Granger. Me wanting a convenient fuck? and you being the only option. Get out of my face! Now! She shouted, removing her wand from her back pocket. She could feel her eyes watering, and she refused to let him see her crumble. Draco held his ground for a few moments, his intense glare shifting between her face and her wand before he spun on his heel and disappeared into his room. Hermione was quaking violently, her chest heaving as she tried to gather some semblance of control, but it was impossible. She managed to choke out a quick silencing charm before she collapsed to the floor and coughed up a string of heart-hurting sobs. She passed the stage where her lungs burned, but she couldn't stop, despite the physical pain searing through her chest. His words shouldn't have killed her. She had, after all, experienced his cruel attitude on so many occasions. But that kiss, it had been deceptive, leading her into a false sense of promise that had convinced her to bear her soul to him. And he had just spat on it. She felt cheated and used. And the worst thing was, she had no idea at what point she would have told him to stop if she would have even told him to stop. Screw her Gryffindor tendencies. She gave up. This has been an unabridged audio chapter of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. A special thank you goes out to Bex Chan for allowing me the privilege to read her story. To recommend your favorite Harry Potter fanfiction for future audiobook episodes, please visit Fox Fix Facebook page and Instagram through the links located in our description below. You can also help support us with donations through our PayPal account to help produce and shape in our future narrated fanfictions. Thank you for listening. Please join us next time for a continuation of this magical fanfiction. See you then!